A country's wealth is measured by how it treats and responds to the poor, the hungry, and the oppressed. Traditionally, it is understood that the United States is the richest country that the world has ever known. And look how we would treat our poor, our hungry, and our oppressed. The American Religious Town Hall meeting is now in session. Welcome, friends, to the American Religious Town Hall meeting, where the discussion of religious, political, and social issues is meant to promote the cause of religious freedom and to help us better understand each other. And now, here's your host and moderator, Pastor Jerry Lutz. Thank you. I'm so glad you've decided to join us for today's discussion. We look forward to this as we've gathered around this table. Looking forward to hear what each panelist has to say. But I'd like for you to in, be, be introduced to each of the panelists. I'm going to ask them to say their name and tell a little bit about what they do. Let's begin with a gentleman to my right. Thank you. My name is Mel Robeck. Uh, I'm Senior Professor of Church History and Ecumenics and Special Assistant to the President for Ecumenical Relations at Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. I am also an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God. I'm Rabbi Dan Levin. I'm the Senior Rabbi at Temple Bethel of Boca Raton, Florida. I'm Tom Plumley. I'm the Senior Minister at First Christian Church in downtown Fort Worth, Texas. We're a part of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. My name is Canon John Peterson. I am an Episcopal priest, and I'm canonically resident in the Diocese of Washington, D.C. Hi, I'm Carl Troval. I'm the Richard J. Dinda Professor of Lutheran Identity and Mission at Concordia University in Austin, Texas, which is affiliated with the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Hi, I'm Tony Matthews, and I'm the Senior Pastor at North Garland Baptist <coughs> Fellowship in Garland, Texas. Well, thank you everyone for being here. As you can see, we have a very qualified panel assembled here for today's discussion. I'm so glad they could be here to join in this conversation today. Early in 2020, the New York Stock Exchange hit new highs. The NASDAQ at the end of last year passed 9,000 points for the first time in its history. According to Gallup, 54% of Americans own stock either directly or as a part of a fund. However, out of the 54%, 84% of the stocks are owned by the wealthiest 10%, 9.3 for the next 10%, and only 6.7% of the stocks are owned by the bottom 80%. In a recent article in ATD, Fourth World, it was argued poverty is the constant stress of not having enough food to eat, of not knowing where you're going to sleep tonight, of knowing you are only one emergency away from sleeping on the streets. While we describe the United States as the richest nation in the world, the United States ranks near the bottom on rankings of developed countries for both adult and child poverty. In both the Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, our holy books have a lot to say about the poor, the hungry, the oppressed. What do we have to say about such income inequality in this nation where 84% of the stocks are owned by the wealthiest 10% of Americans and yet there is so much adult and child poverty? Today I'd like our panelists to consider that question, but there are three in particular that I have in mind for them to discuss and answer. First of all, what responsibility does society have to care for its poor, the hungry, and the oppressed? Another question, what responsibility does the synagogue, church, mosque have to speak out about income inequality in the United States? And then finally, do you consider it to be a scandal that the richest nation in the world would rank so high in both adult and child poverty? That's our important subject for today. It is a timely one to be sure. Let's go back to those who helped to begin the program by making opening statements. For that, we go back to Dr. Troval. Thank you for being here today. And what are your concerns and other perspectives based on your opening statement? Well, I think that the uh, opening statement uh, lays out some pretty uh, harsh statistics that are uh, um, 
uh, tr troubling to those of us who care mm -hmm. about the poor in our nation. And I think I, I, a few comments just in, as far as prefacing. I mean, there's this kind of idea, I think, often out there that money is somehow inherently evil. And yet it's not the money that's really evil. I mean, even in the New Testament, it says uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. And so it's, it's about uh, greed, really, in particular, that we might be talking about. Uh, secondly, the reason why money becomes so significant is because money, I don't think people always understand this, but money equals power in our society, and it has in every society. So it's about people's ability to use power, the ability to dominate others, the ability to, uh, or even the power yourself to be free. I mean, insofar as you have more money, you have more freedom because you can travel to more places, you can influence more people, you, uh, um, so there's, there's power involved. And uh, I think a third component of this, uh, just by, to set up what's, where I'm going and where we can go with the discussion, is that I think in our society we have this belief that somehow if you have wealth, it's because of your individual work ethic and it's connected to how hard you work. And if you don't have wealth, I mean, it's because you really are not very good at working or you just haven't invested what resources and opportunities you've been given. Because after all, we are the wealthiest nation. You have plenty of opportunities. There's a lot of wealth out there. And if you don't have any, it's because you have done something personally morally problematic to not get it. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, the older I get, I realize we are so dependent on where we're born um, and the amount of money our parents had, which gives us a particular leg up in society with education or anything else. It gives us opportunities for jobs. It's the people who can afford to go golfing with particular people who help them get them better jobs. Um, so all your connections that you make because of your wealth end up giving you opportunities other people never get. And really, I mean, the world is always skewed toward uh, people who have that ability to have access to that wealth and power. And what I think this is laying out is that a certain, a, there are people who are outrageously wealthy, and I'm not suggesting that all those people who are outrageously wealthy in our society um, are, are the problem. But I think when you look at the structure of how the money is distributed and who gets rewarded for it and who has access to it, um, that's where we get into problems because it, 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 you, know, you can say, well, it's how schools use money, whether you get a good education or not. Well, how come it's, it always seems like the people who live in the wealthiest districts seem to get better educations than people who live in the poorest districts. Yes, and yet education is exactly one of those things that actually empowers people to be able to make decisions about their wealth. And I mean, I could go on, my point, I could go on and on, but my point is that there are these structural things that we need to really be working on. It isn't just about redistribution. It's actually about changing the structures. And uh, I mean, I have more to say, but I wanna, I know everyone else has got a lot to say on this too. Okay. But I wanna lay out some well, things as I see them that we need to address as a nation. Thank you, and you've done very well. Let's go to Ken and Peterson and your thoughts on your opening statement. Well, uh, more thoughts. My more thoughts, yes. <laughs> I, I would want to say yes to Carl. I mean, I agree with everything he said. I, I think that one thing that I might say a little bit differently is that I'm not a, concerned about the, the top, top amount of money that they have. I mean, that is not as much of a problem. I'm not talking about redistribution of wealth, et cetera. But, but underneath that top level, 10%, or even me, maybe the top 20%, um, under that, 80% of the people, you know, are really feeling feeling it. Mm -hmm. I mean, to to say that the stock market has never been higher or Nasdaq has never been higher, um, that does not sh d uh, ac adequately show what is happening in the United States in relationship to the economics of most of the people in this country today. Yeah. And to, to me, that is where the crisis is, because. Um, I mean, one fourth, 25 percent of the, the people in this country work for less than ten dollars an hour. Think, 25 percent. Who can live on on ten dollars an hour today? And the, and I always want to look at this then in the point of view of the scripture. But what uh, the church has, uh, Jesus has to say about it, because. You, at this point here, you simply cannot have a sustainable lifestyle. All right. Thank you very much. So Dr. Robeck, your thoughts on the subject? 
this is a very difficult issue, uh, I think for a, a whole range of reasons. Uh, I don't know any rich people. <laughs> Everybody I know is rich. Uh, I mean, by comparison to the, the world, I mean, I have yeah. traveled so far, so many places all over the world, and I've seen poverty, and I've seen poverty. Mm. Uh, we have bad situations in the United States, no doubt about that, and we have poverty, and I don't, uh, I don't want to dismiss that at all. I recognize the reality of that. Uh, I have a son who's uh, 40 years old and who uh, has to live on disability. Uh, he cannot hold a job because of physical uh, problems, and uh, they're multiple. He gets $1,350 a month, whether he needs it or not. That's all he will ever get, ever get. There's nothing in the mm -hmm. bank. There's nothing in uh, uh, future retirement. There's nothing, $1,350. You can't get a one-bedroom apartment in Pasadena for less mm -hmm. than $1,500. Mm -hmm. So what's he going to do? What's he going to do? Um, and I think that's a good example, but it's not anywhere close to some of the people that we would know uh, that are making less than $10 an hour, uh, working long hours, trying to make ends meet, trying to help their families grow, trying to give them uh, uh, help. I think one of the things that has helped Patsy and me is that we were taught as children, both of us, that it was important to tithe, which meant giving back to God money that he had given to us through the strength that he's provided us to live, to support ourselves, and so forth. I'm not suggesting that tithing gets you anything. Mm -hmm. I am suggesting that tithing gives you a way of looking at life. That is, this money is not just for me. It's not mine. It's for God to use in whatever position. And that's why in my congregation or any congregation I would be part of, I would argue very strongly that that money needs to be used uh, as in a good stewardship program to help people who are desperately in need. I think, uh, you know, to be able to go <clears throat> past the tithe and into offerings over and above that, which frankly I'm able to do, but only because the seminary where I worked set up a fund for retirement that makes me very wealthy by comparison to other people. And I can have a lot of white guilt over that, or I can use that money uh, to help bring other people up. My problem with the really rich is they never think about these things, or they seem never to think about these things. All right, thank you very much. Dr. Matthews, welcome to the program. Um, Your yeah, thoughts, I'm, please. I'm all over the place with this topic here. Um, questions, I have questions. Um, I, I, as a Christian, as a um, pastor of a church, I'm a firm believer that we need to do everything we can to help the needy, the poor, the least of these. And I think we need to do it um, consistently, not just seasonally. I think that needs to, need to be part of our DNA. Um, in addition, we need to speak to um, um, voices and to people who can help assist mm -hmm. Um, folks who are, are, are living um, um, in, in poverty. Um, I grew up in the inner city of Buffalo, New York, and I've seen both sides. Um, I'm not rich. I, um, we grew up poor. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to college because the Lord gave me a talent to play basketball, and I got a scholarship, and I furthered my education, and that seemed to help me in terms of finances. Um, I read an article, when I, when I got this, I read an article um, by George Barna, and uh, the article is titled, The Good News About Global Poverty, and this article says that ex extreme poverty is actually declining. So then when I read that, here I am saying, okay, is this a case of don't bother me with the facts, my mind's made up? <laughs> um, and so I, I'm just, the income inequality is a, is a, is a major problem, um, but then when I read we got all these jobs that have been created. I have a question about that. You know, people are working. Then I know people who, who um, leave a job, then they get plugged into another job right away. Um, help wanted signs all over. And I do know personally that I know a lot of folks who have dug themselves in financial holes. And when you do that, you can't put the shovel in somebody else's hand. So you, you have to take some responsibility. But I think the, the legitimately poor people we need to help them. I'm a firm believer, but I just don't think it's 
it, this is just something I grapple with. All right, thank you very much. And, and then Rabbi Levin, glad to have you here again today. Your thoughts on the subject, please. So there's a, a sage uh, from the rabbinic period named Hillel who famously asked two questions. He said, if I am not for myself, who will be for me? But if I am only for myself, what am I? Yeah, his third question was, if not now, when? Which mm -hmm. I think also bears on the subject. Mm -hmm. The reason why Hillel was a genius was he didn't answer those questions. Mm -hmm. He just posed them. <laughs> uh, yeah, because how we keep those questions in balance with each other, I think, really pertains to this conversation. There is nothing evil in and of itself of wealth. Yes, mm -hmm. of course. Uh, and uh, it's a matter of different questions which is how do we help those who cannot help themselves? How do we yeah. raise up those who cannot raise up themselves? Those are questions of human compassion, of justice, of fairness and dignity. If you look in the book of Leviticus, it says when you harvest your field, you have to leave the edges and the gleanings mm -hmm. for the poor and the stranger. Mm -hmm. And if you think about what it took to harvest a field and cultivate a field in ancient times in biblical Israel without modern day equipment and machinery, think about what that sacrifice meant. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they did it that way was not just because you had to take care of the poor and the needy. It was also to make sure you took care of them in a way that preserved their human dignity. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that's mm -hmm. really most important is that we realize that when you see someone who has less, that the plight of that person is our collective responsibility. There's so much selfishness and chauvinism that we see in our culture today that says, well, what's mine is mine and I worked hard to get it and it belongs to me and well, that's too bad for that person. And I think that income inequality in and of itself would be much less of a scourge if we didn't see so many people who were locked into the bottom. I think the last thing I would say is we have to think about what it is that we say when we say that the labor of an individual is worth less than $10 an hour. What does it say about the worth of that individual when we say the work of your hands, the work of your body, the work of your, your labor is worth less than $10 an hour? And I think that there's a problem in a society that says that your labor is worth less than something uh, that would define that person as less than. All right, thank you very much. And now Reverend Plumley, your thoughts please. Thank you. Um, I, I think this is all a very fine discussion. I, 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 I approach the program f more from the, the point of view of the, uh, the, the, the questions that were asked that uh, basically, I think, um, uh, send us in the direction of, of asking, uh, do, we, do we really have uh, the kind of strength in our economy that we say we do, uh, or do we not? Um, is, is our nation strong, or is it not? Uh, and as long as the, the income gap is growing in the way it is, um, it seems to me like we have a difficult time saying that we do have a strong economy, that we do have a strong nation. I think part of the problem is uh, those so-called economic indicators that, that uh, are looked to by uh, economists, journalists, uh, politicians uh, to, to make the determination about, about whether we're doing well or not uh, are are, are, are based in something besides the, the sorts of, of moral uh, conversations that, that, that we're having here. They're based in um, uh, other things that have to do with, that have to do with, with uh, uh, dollars and cents and, and um, how, uh, how, how much total money is out there available for people without paying any attention, paying enough attention to the fact that the, that the money is not distributed fairly or appropriately. Okay, we just have a few seconds, about 30 seconds left. And Dr. Matthews, did you have? Yeah, yeah real quickly, yes. I, I think um, this is a matter of education as well. Um, when we, I don't think it's the amount a person makes, I think it's how you manage what you make. Yep. And so if you make 10, 15, $20 an hour, I think we can 
teach people how to invest in the stock market. Um, I, I, I actually celebrate the fact that the, the, the NASDAQ passed 9,000 points. I think that's something to celebrate. And, um, and at the same time, we need to assist those who are not part of the stock market. So let's educate people, teach them how to invest. And I don't think it's the amount of money you have, it's how you manage it. All right, thank you. That's all the time we have for this part of the program. But there is another part of the program that we'd like for you to stand by to watch. Uh, until then, there's an important announcement I'd like for you to listen to, and we'll be back in just a few moments for the panelists' summations. Thank you, Pastor Lutz. We hope you are enjoying today's program. If you would like to learn more about the American Religious Town Hall, please visit our website at AmericanReligious.org. That's AmericanReligious.org. There you can read about the mission and history of the program, learn about the town hall estates, and view past programs by clicking the appropriate menu buttons. Each week, Pastor Lutz looks forward to receiving your letters. You may write to him at the address shown on your screen. Send your letters to Pastor Jerry Lutz, American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas 75218. That's Pastor Jerry Lutz. American Religious Town Hall Meeting, P.O. Box 180118, Dallas, Texas 75218. Thank you for writing and thank you for watching. And now, back to you, Pastor Lutz, and today's closing statements. Thank you, Mark. And I do look forward to hearing from you. Uh, you know the way to get in touch with us. Mark has given you some suggestions. I would also encourage you to go to the website. There you can find out more about the Town Hall Estates. You can see some of the past programs we've archived for you. And then also, please remember to send your suggestions as to what subjects you'd like for the panelists to discuss in future programs. Let's go now to our summations. We'll begin with Dr. Robeck. You're first. Yeah, this is a very hard issue. Uh, when I think about uh, government, when I think about the role of the church or uh, faith communities, um, I think that the people who uh, need to hear the story are not only the poor, but also the rich. To help them understand the nature of stewardship as a community of people. I mean, we say we're one nation, one people under God. Uh, but I don't think that the government is a good way to teach that. I don't think it does a very good job at all. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that many of these people who have money think they have everything they need. And it's a very difficult thing to help them understand the moral responsibility that they might have to others with the money that has been given to them. However they earned it or however it was given, uh, they're still responsible for its use. All right, thank you very much, Reverend Plumley. Summation. Yeah, earlier in the program, Dr. Robeck spoke of 10% uh, of, of our income being God's. Um, uh, I, I was raised to believe that uh, all of, of our course. income is God's and it uh, is given to me or to whoever it's given uh, to manage appropriately right. and ethically and uh, my ethics, economic ethics, begin with that presumption. Yep. All right, thank you very much. Dr. Trovall, your summation, please. Sure, since uh, Bishop Olson isn't here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow something from the Roman Catholic yes. tradition, which I'm deeply appreciative. It's been, I, I love the Roman Catholic social uh, ethical tradition uh, when it comes to economics. And there's a specific idea Pope John Paul, a conservative pope, so the second used, uh, the preferential option for the poor. He's drawing on history, of course. Yeah. Which, this is what it means. And it was, it was mind expanding for me in this way. That the wealthy will always have someone to advocate for them in whatever they need to take care of. But the poor have no lobbying group. They do not have anyone who can help them um, other than themselves. And that it's the obligation of the Christian church, those of us as the people of God, we always have to think first, what's the impact of any policy first on the poor before we think of anyone else? Because you prefer its effects on the poor first and then how it affects others. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Dr. Matthews. Yeah, I think the answer. old saying, I may get it mixed up, but if you give a person a fish, mm. you um, feed them for a day, you teach them how to fish, feed them for life. 
And I just think education is so crucial. And, and um, we, we have an obligation to take care of the poor, uh, minister to them, help them, and um, life will be better. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Canon Peterson, your summation, please. Yes, I really believe that income equality becomes an issue about the nature of the value of a human being. True. I think, I think that that is so important. And not only the value, but the dignity of a human being. And I believe this is a religious issue. This is a religious issue. Um, I also believe us that God shows, I mean, that the scripture shows us that God has a heart for the poor. God has a heart for the poor. And the Archbishop of Canterbury has gone so far as to say, I think there is such a thing as God's bias for the poor. Mm. Thank you very much. Rabbi Levin, your summation, please. I think we've all been taught that to whom much is given, much is expected. And I think we've lost a bit of that in our society. I think there's a lot of people who, who believe to whom much is given, it must have been deserved. <laughs> and I'm not sure that uh, that actually computes. In our tradition, we are taught that the poor are supposed to be as members of your own household, mm -hmm. that you're supposed to care for them, take responsibility for them as if they are your own kin. And in our tradition, the word that is used to help take care of the poor is called tzedakah, which does not mean charity. Sadaka so means justice. And I think when we think about how we help the poor, how we advocate for the poor, how we help the poor to escape the chains of systemic poverty, you ask yourself really fundamental, crucial questions. What is fair? What is right? What is just? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. Well done, everyone. Really appreciated today's discussion. I hope you have too, as you've been watching and listening. We hope that this has inspired you to think about ways that you can address the concerns that have been expressed around this table. If you belong to a faith community, talk this over with your religious leader and see what your congregation or your group can do to actually address these issues, whether it's education or learning how to spend your money responsibly, whatever it is you can do to become a part of the solution and not be a part of this big problem. So thank you so much for tuning in. For now, the Charter of the American Religious Town Hall provides that Roman Catholics, Protestants, Jews, educators, and others may appear on this program and can declare their beliefs without hesitancy. And the rest of the members of the panel will uphold and guarantee that American right to all who will appear, irrespective of race or creed, so that the rest of the world can see that here in America, we believe in civil and religious freedom, not only in theory, but in reality. So now, friends, until next week at the same time and over this very same channel, the American Religious Town Hall meeting stands adjourned. And may the God of all of us bless all of you. <laughs>